Well, hello everyone. This is going to be the second part of the recording for the, um, we're going to get into post-exilic prophets. Um, we're going to start with Obadiah, which is very short, and Haggai, which is very short. And that's all that we're going to cover in the shorter uh, recording today. Hope you like my red shirt. Um, let's see what I want to do here is reduce this. Actually, we want to do this. There we go. All right. Let's get started with uh, the prophet Obadiah. And I'm going to minimize this. Remember, we're multitasking here. Here we go. So there's our deep thought picture. And you can see um, we're going to talk about the significant relationship of two brothers, Jacob and Esau. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. But Obadiah. All right. Let's go ahead. And uh, so the, the book of Obadiah is like a one stoplight town. Everybody get that one. Because it's just got one chapter. And we're going to see in the book of Obadiah, the prophet shares um, his prophetic concerns for the nations, just like we've seen other uh, prophets do, where they have the, you know, the oracles against the nations, Ezekiel, and all of, all of the prophets had those larger sections. Obadiah is just presenting one oracle against a single nation, and that's the nation of Edom. Now, historically, Edom and Israel um, share a long history together that goes all the way back to the patriarchal times. Um, see, Israel is Jacob, and Edom comes from Esau, the brothers. Remember, let's go back to Genesis 25 and, and remind ourselves of, of this just briefly. Remember in like, for example, chapter 25 in Genesis, we go back to verse 25. Now the first uh, came forth red and all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. And afterward his brother came forth with, with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. Thus the heel grabber, or the one who strives, that's Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when um, she gave birth, uh, that is, um, Rebekah gave birth here to the, to the brothers. Now, this, so this is the beginning of the, of the history. If we move ahead now, we, we move over to verse 30. Esau says to Jacob, Please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. All right, so the naming of the brothers. The sibling rivalry that we see. If we move over to chapter 28 in Genesis, we remind ourselves of that. And as a result of the sibling rivalry, um, so Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing which with, his, which with which his father had blessed him. And Esau says to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So if you remember in Gen uh, Old Testament Survey 1, we developed a lot uh, and talked a lot about this sibling rivalry uh, that is established between these brothers. And we saw later in the, in the narrative, uh, the Jacob narrative, that there was this reconciliation that eventually did take place between Jacob and Esau. That's when they met, and, and Jacob runs out to embrace his brother Esau. And there's this um, very moving um, hugging and, and exchanging of words, and shalom is established between the brothers. However, it seems historically that Edom, Edom as a nation never fully got over Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, stealing of both birthright and blessing. And maybe it wasn't help that we have Isaac, uh, the father, saying to them in verse 39 in chapter 27, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, and away from the dew of heaven from above, and by your sword you, that is Edom, shall live. And your brother uh, you shall serve, but it shall be uh, come about uh, when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. So there's this grudge that's established. Um, other prophets um, later will point out in their, um, in their uh, oracle accounts, uh, for example, uh, how, or that you might have some windows into the reputation that Edom has as a nation. If we go to uh, Ezekiel, for example, let's turn over there 
and Ezekiel, uh, what do we got, chapter 25, we can look, look there, Ezekiel 25, beginning in verse 12, so here's the oracle that Ezekiel provides against Edom, thus says the Lord, because Edom has acted against the house of Judah by taking vengeance and has incurred grievous guilt and avenged themselves upon them, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will stretch out my hand against Edom and cut off man and beast from it, and I will lay it waste from Taman and to Dedan, and will fall by the sword, and I will lay my vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel. Therefore they will act in Edom according to my anger and according to my wrath. Thus they will know my vengeance, declares the Lord God. Pretty pretty intense, but then we come up back to Obadiah, and let's uh, pick up with verse 10. Because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered into his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem, you too were as one of them. Verse 12, don't gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune, and do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of, of their distress. Do not enter the gate of my, my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you, you do not gloat over their calamity in the day of their disaster. And do not loot their wealth in the day of their disaster. And do not stand at the fork of the road to cut down their fugitives. And do not imprison their survivors in the day of their distress. Well, you see that the context here for Obadiah is obviously the rejoicing this is a picture of Edom gloating and rejoicing and taking advantage of, of the enemy attack on the capital city of Jerusalem. And we know that in verse 11, it seems pretty obvious and clear that Edom even aided Babylon, the Babylonians, uh, in, in, in with the overthrow of Jerusalem. All right, pretty desperate times. Now, it's a great little short book if you're, if you're doing a preaching uh, sermon, uh, or if you want to focus in a sermon on how do we respond to the bullies? How do we respond to injustice? Um, I was thinking about putting a picture up of uh, given the events of this week, but I didn't of uh, Sutherland Springs and the, the event that's happened down there. Just just as a way of reminder, what does injustice look like? And um, it's interesting to see the prophet. Obadiah and uh, his particular response as he's writing this and perhaps sharing this with the exiles uh, with their ministry of trying to understand you know we saw the Edomites gloating and, and mocking and, and jeering uh, as as our precious city fell so as the you know you've got people who are grieving they're grieving we grieve when we have injustice uh, thrown in our face we grieve when we see injustice in the world and this kind of um, violence that ensues. Um, how's the prophet Obadiah respond? Interestingly, um, he's going to say, like many of the other prophets before have said, he sees that the Lord will have the final say on his day. Starting in verse 15. For the day of the Lord draws near on all of the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. Because just as you drink on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow and become as if they had never existed. But on Mount Zion, there will be those who escape and it will be holy. And the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. Um, we'll just pause there. So Obadiah reminds us that the Lord's kingdom is coming. Um, and with it comes a reversal of all injustice. Um, I should have said earlier that scholars, it's hard to put in and fit into the timeline um, exactly where to put Obadiah um, in terms of his message. But I think it's based on what we've just said. Here's why I place Obadiah in with some of the other post-exilic prophets, just because of the vantage point that this prophet's going to have. Um, 
maybe right on top of the exile. Maybe he's closer to Jeremiah and his vantage point. Remember Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations being written to service and assist those exiles in Babylon who are grieving. Uh, Obadiah might be um, right on top of the activity with regards to uh, seeing Edom and how Edom as a nation is responding to the fall of Jerusalem. So, But writing from a vantage point just after and then in anticipation of the uh, you know, ministering to those exiles uh, and maybe on the verge of the exiles who are coming back. So that's, but the, again, we don't break a church up over these things uh, for sure. But we see that the Lord will have the final say. Verse 18, then the house of Jacob will be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame, but the house of Esau will be as a stubble and they will set them on fire and consume them so that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken. Then those of the Negev will possess the mountain of Esau, and those of the Chapella, uh, the Philistine plain. Also they will possess the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. Let's just pause there. Well, I can read all the way down to the end. And the exiles of, of this host of the sons of Israel, who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem, who are in uh, Shepharav, will possess the cities of the Negev. The deliverers will ascend Mount Sion to judge the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. Well, on the day of the Lord, we see that Esau, the Edomites, and for that matter, any other nation or individual will receive judgment on this day. Obadiah shares this picture or vision of the day of the Lord with other prophets, um, such as Zephaniah. Uh, let's turn to Zephaniah, another short book, but in chapter 3, just remind ourselves, verses 8 through 11. Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to, to the prey. Indeed, my decision is to go to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation. I'll also add the idea of judgment. All my burning anger for all of the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. Then I'll give to the people purified lips that all of them may call on the name of Yahweh to serve him shoulder to shoulder. And again in um, Zechariah chapter 14, we'll remind ourselves of this. And, and again, when we get to Zechariah uh, in a couple weeks, Zechariah 14 verses 7 through 9. Zechariah writes, for it will be a unique day, that is the day of the Lord, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but it will come about that at the evening time there will be light. And it will come about in that day that living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them towards the east, half of them towards the west, western sea. It will be summer as well as in winter. And here's the, the punchline verse, verse 9, and, and the Lord Yahweh will be king over all of the earth in that day. The Lord will be the only one. And his name, his reputation, will be the only one. So the establishment of, of the kingdom of Yahweh, the kingdom of the Lord on the day of the Lord, we, we've talked about this. We're not going somewhere. It's coming to us. And this is the uh, realization. So Obadiah's last word also lines up. The last word of the Hebrew Bible, if we go back to the very last verse in verse 21, the deliverers will ascend Mount Zion. You remember uh, the point I've made before. In the closing of the Hebrew canon, the last book of the old Hebrew Old Testament, the last book that Paul and, and Jesus and all of his disciples read in the first century church, was Second Chronicles. And it's interesting, Second Chronicles also ends with that um, invitation to go up, uh, where it's interestingly right in the middle of the Cyrus Decree. Thus says, Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is a, a, among you of all of his people, may the Lord Yahweh, his God, be with him and let him go up. Isn't it ironic how the historian, the chronicler, uh, puts the words in the word, puts word, <laughs> puts his, the, the Lord's words in the words of a pagan king? in this case Cyrus, um, as an invitation to go up to Zion. 
So Obadiah is recognizing this as well. He recognizes that in the coming kingdom, the Lord's eternal kingdom is the one coming to earth. Verse 21. Remember we saw this just last week, or maybe if you're reading these together, watching these together, Daniel was another prophet working behind the scenes to acknowledge the uh, those who are in exile, perhaps even encouraging those coming back. In chapter 9, remember, uh, here we go. Remember in his passage where he's unpacking, um, here he's hearing from Gabriel, Daniel 9, 13. Not, no, 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 Daniel 9. Uh, no, Daniel 9, chapter 9, ah, verse Um, yes, Daniel 9, 13 through 14. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to thy truth. Therefore the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us, for the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all of his deeds which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. Um, no, that is not what I'm talking about. I think I mislisted uh, that verse. Um, but there are, I, I don't want to take time to find it now, but I think I was just referring to Daniel's overall strategy uh, and focus on the coming kingdom, the Lord's coming eternal kingdom. Uh, that was the emphasis that we saw in Daniel as well. All right, now let's talk about the, and kind of make this transition, writing on the back of Obadiah. There's we have to recognize that uh, after the Cyrus decree in uh, 538, we've got this group of Israelites who are ready to move, who are ready to act. You know, they've heard and they're aware of Jeremiah's prophecy. Seventy years has passed. It's, it's complete. It's come true. We would have Ezekiel and his visions of the glory of the Lord filling the temple, still ringing in their ears. This is a group who has heard about the Lord's miraculous uh, protection of Daniel and his friends, uh, the fiery furnace, the, the, the den of lions. They are aware of how God has brought about the defeat of the Babylonians at the hands of this servant, uh, this Persian king, Cyrus, uh, just as Isaiah had prophesied. So you remember Isaiah's reference to the servant, Cyrus, who will act and on behalf of God's agenda and benefiting God's people. So you can see all of these um, intersections of encouragement. This is a group that comes and is serious about rebuilding God's house, reestablishing the covenant community, uh, and this covenant community that's going to return back to the basics uh, with a focus on Torah obedience the and, and re whole heartfelt response to the covenant instruction that they have from Moses. Uh, with all of these hopes for the future, uh, you know, and the promises of the Lord. So the prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi now, will all come to share this uh, post-exilic historical vantage point um, in and around the events after Cyrus's decree in 538 BC. They're going to share the same audience and encourage the same group that we have operating in those historical books, Ezra, Nehemiah, and I'd throw in also uh, Chronicles because that's the recast, recasted his, history that is an intended and rewritten for this group of exiles who have come back. So all that to say with regards to background information for all of these prophets. Let's take a look at another uh, short book and finish with today. Let's turn to Haggai. And it's a one, another one of those uh, one horse, <laughs> one stoplight towns, right? Here we go. Haggai, Haggai, Haggai. Got it. Right before Zechariah. So Haggai is going to directly, and there's our deep thought picture. Isn't it beautiful? Haggai. And Haggai is going to have some encouragement specifically that relates to the temple rebuilding activity that's going on. Um, let's remind ourselves by uh, keep our finger there so we don't lose our place in Haggai. 
Let's go back to one of the historical books in Ezra and remind ourselves of the historical situation that's going on um, back home, Ezra, Nehemiah. So Ezra, I'm looking in, um, really, the whole context of Ezra 1 through 6 really is uh, where and when Haggai is uh, doing his uh, primary uh, prophetic ministry. But back in Ezra chapter 4, verses 4 through 5, Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building. They hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Uh, now, uh, in the reign, uh, that's, that's as far as I want to read right there. So you see the discouragement that's coming um, from the people of the land. Now, these are those who are the poorest of the poor that we kind of left off there with, with Jeremiah the prophet. So the dating of Haggai's activity is probably around 520 up to 516 B.C. Zechariah will be a contemporary of Haggai and also active during the same time period. Over in chapter 5 and Ezra, verses 1 and 2. When the prophets Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God in Israel who was over them, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, and Jeshua, the son of uh, jo Josadak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them and supporting them. So that's basically the very encouraging and supportive role that Haggai and Zechariah have um, during that time. Scholars will also point out strong similarities in subject matter between Haggai and chapters uh, 1 through 8 in Zechariah. So let's go back now to Haggai chapter 1 verse 1 through 9 and just see the, uh, the kind of uh, encouragement that Haggai is delivering. Okay, so let's pick up his message in verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, this people says, the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but there's, um, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains, bring wood and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. Um, let's go one more verse here. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little when you bring it up, when you bring it home. I and I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because my house, which lies desolate, because of my house, which lies desolate, while each of your, each of you runs to his own house. So that gets into a little bit of um, encouraging judgment. <laughs> there seems to be more concern about the rebuilding of the homes and in the neighborhoods around Jerusalem rather than the rebuilding of the place where worship should be going on. So that's the initial um, charge there. Now, so we, we read before, the rebuilding uh, begins uh, under the leadership of, of the uh, appointed governor, Zerubbabel. And the builders work with uh, only the remains, and we see here kind of, not that bad, but in the picture, but with the remains of what was there before and anything else that, they, that, that could be salvaged. So Haggai encourages this group. Um, chapter 2, verses uh, 1 through 2. On the 21st of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Verse 3, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? How do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? Um, this creates a difficult situation for some, um, and we kind of find some parallels to this back in Ezra chapter 3, uh, verse, tw uh, verse 12. 
Yet many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers, households, and old men who had seen the first temple, they wept out loud. They wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, while many shouted for joy. So the people could not distinguish the shout of uh, the shout of joy from the sound of weeping of the people, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard far away. So that might be the cause of the weeping. In other words, the temple that Solomon had, the, the temple that they were rebuilding, pales in comparison with regards to the temple that Solomon had built. They didn't have all of the wealth. They didn't have the best contractors, the best construction workers, the best materials. So notice this is very timely for the prophet Haggai in terms of how he's going to encourage this group. <clears throat> Let's read on here in verse 4 down through verse 9 what the prophet Haggai says to this group that's really uh, um, kind of hanging in the balance with regards to encouragement. He says, kind of all reminds us of the message of Joshua uh, before taking the land, to be, you know, be courageous. But now take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all of the people of the land to take courage, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. As for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also and the dry land, and I will also shake the nations, and they will come with the wealth of the nations, and I will fill this house with my glory, declares the Lord. I see a little uh, parallel to, uh, to a couple of things there. The filling of this house with glory might be writing on the back of the vision that Ezekiel has had with the coming temple, the temple of the Lord that will be coming from heaven to find its permanent place on, on earth. You see what uh, the prophet Haggai is doing here. He's pointing them ahead, not to this temple, but to the temple that's going to come. Uh, he says in verse uh, 8, The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. But notice this in verse 9, The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I shall give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So you see, um, this is the, and the message of encouragement to the, to the group that's come back. Look, it's not about the building per se. It's about the, the heartfelt activity that's going on inside of this place. Uh, it's the worship that's going on in there. It's about my presence with my people, declares the Lord. And you always need to have this long view, this like we, what we said at the beginning of our discussion of Daniel in the part two video that I made, we're long-term investors with regards to this program. God has a plan and it's coming. The day of the Lord also includes the, the temple that's going to come in this permanent idea. So um, whenever you meet in a place like this to have church, you're always looking down the road and knowing that this building, whatever it is and whatever shape that it's in, will be eventually replaced um, this would have been also, uh, there would have probably been a strong messianic expectation amongst this group. Um, a king from the Davidic line is coming to rule again. If we go back to Ezekiel and just remind ourselves of some of the prophetic words that would have probably still been ringing in their ears. Ezekiel encouraged the group before they leave, uh, before they leave exile to come back, um, with some pretty powerful words. Ezekiel chapter 37, remember beginning in verse 24. Of course, this is the restoration that's built on the vision of the valley of the dry bones. The dry bones receive flesh and become alive. So this coming alive message is also riding on the back of, of the Davidic kingdom, which was everlastingly promised back in 2 Samuel chapter 7 through the prophet Nathan. But see, we see flesh coming alive on it as well. Chapter 37, verse 24. And my servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. And they shall live in the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers lived. And they will live on it, they and their sons, and their sons' sons forever. There's that forever language again. 
And David, my servant, will be prince or king over them forever. One from the seed, uh, the, uh, the everlasting line coming from King David. And I will make a covenant of shalom with them, and it will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. So I see, oh, one more verse. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. So this is future. This is coming. So again, whatever shanty kind of house or temple that they build, whatever state of repair or disrepair that it's in, they need to know that eventually God himself is coming to establish his kingdom. And as part of that, his sanctuary or his permanent dwelling, his temple will, will be coming as well. Um, so this is encouragement. And I think that's what we see coming on with Haggai in chapter 2 here. His encouragement strategy is not, not too far removed here from what we just read in Ezekiel. Um, all right. Well, that's all I have to say about um, Haggai. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, we, we'll just... Um, yeah, I think even if... Uh, one thing I just wanted to make a connection there. I think Zerubbabel, at least, is encouraged to see himself as chosen by God for this time and place. And his, his role certainly falls in line with that messianic expectation. But if it's not Zerubbabel or a king, uh, even, even if he's a, an appointed king, a king or governor, then it will be one who comes after him. So... Um, Let's just finish the last few verses here of Haggai, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I'm going to shake the heavens and earth, and when I overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of those kingdoms of the nations, and I will overthrow the chariots and the riders and the horses and the riders will go down, everyone, by the sword of another. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shittil, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Well, certainly there's focus there on Zerubbabel, but certainly through Zerubbabel, there's kind of the reestablishing of this anticipation that one will be coming who from the line of David will come and permanently reside as the shepherd or prince or king over, over God's people. So, all right, well, that's all that I want to say about um, this week, and, and we'll pick up with um, Zachariah next week.